So I am now joined by Matt Brunig. He, of course, is the founder and president of the People's Policy Project, but we just know him here as the Welfare King. Matt, good to see you as always. Oh, thanks for having me back. So uh, last week, the New York Times ran a piece that seems to contain on, on its face some good news, right? So the title of the piece is Expanded Safety Net Drives Sharp Drop in Child Poverty. Uh, in the piece, the author sort of covers this study that seems to show that child poverty in the U.S. since 1993 has fallen by almost 60%. Uh, so thanks to, you know, various uh, improvements in the social safety net. This is what the study and the New York Times article claim. So uh, that all sounds well and good. Uh, I want to throw a graph from the study up here. Uh, it clearly shows the decline since 1993. Uh, there are some noticeable, you know, steep drops and plateaus in places. Now, Matt, you've since published a few different criticisms of this study and of the New York Times article. Uh, but I, but I want to start with the graph. What first stood out to you when you saw this? Yeah. So, I mean, you look at the graph and you, you basically have three things, like three chunks, right? You got the 90s in which poverty is falling. That much is clear enough um, because employment was growing a lot and that, that matters. You know, as you bring more and more people into the workforce, you're going to get some drops in poverty. That makes sense. Then from 2000 to the mid 2010s, we don't get anything. It's a total flat line. That also makes sense. Two recessions, employment was down. We never even got back to our high 90s level. Okay, everything's pretty much square. Um, and then at the end, you get this sharp drop in 2018, 2019. This is during the Trump years. Um, and it's sort of mysterious, like what's going on there? We were, that's not too long ago. We were all alive. That's, mm -hmm. that's a weird uh, change that occurred. Um, and so that, that's what I really honed in on, especially in my second piece was what, what happened in 2018 and 2019 that could possibly explain this drop, which is like a 25% drop in child poverty relative to 2017. Right. Yeah. So so what what did you find? What happened in 2018? Did child poverty really experience a sharp decline uh, that year? Yeah. So I, um, you know, I looked at what the authors were trying to hinge it on, you know, and they needed an explanation, too. And they tried to say, well, there was an increase in the child tax credit and there was an increase in the child tax credit. But the child tax credit, um, at least in this, not not including last year, but the child tax credit is phased in, meaning poor people, the poorest people are not eligible for it at all. Basically, you get 15 cents of benefits for every dollar you earn over twenty five hundred dollars up to fourteen hundred dollars of total benefits. The long story short was if you made less than twenty five hundred dollars, you didn't get any money from the increased CTC. And if you made less than like ninety two hundred dollars, the most you got from the increased CTC was seventy five dollars per kid. And that's for the whole year. And that seventy five dollars would have been swallowed up by inflation adjustments anyway. So like if you're making less than, you know, nine, ten grand, the CTC wasn't coming to you. Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do was say, OK, so is to say, let, let's look at the incomes of kids up and down the ladder and let's especially compare the incomes of kids at the bottom who we know didn't get the CTC to kids who are around the band where you would expect them to get the increased CTC. And what I found was the poorest kids had the same exact income spike as the kids at the 10th percentile, the 20th percentile, the 30th percentile. Every percentile of kid, you just get in this little blip in 2018. And it's not little, actually. It's like 500 to to $1,000 per person in the in the kids home so like the second percentile kid which is like poor the 98 percent of kids their income almost increased by a thousand dollars per person mm -hmm. so if you got a mom and one kid that's two thousand dollars and that's the poor like poorest poorest they would not have gotten the ctc the ctc was only 75 dollars anyway it mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense right so i'm looking at these blips and i'm thinking okay so something has to explain these blips doesn't really make sense Th these people on the bottom they're not employed that's why they're on the bottom or you know like at that level so what's going on and eventually I, I, I search around and I figure out, oh, in, in 2018, the census for the first time implemented changes to the way um, it asks certain income questions and uh, the way that it does certain family relations, especially around same sex couples. So mm -hmm. my claim <laughs> was that that seems like a much more plausible explanation yeah. for why the poorest kids who aren't even eligible for the CTC had this big spike. Yeah. 
Um, well, you know, on the subject of uh, these various uh, measures and ways of like looking at poverty and looking at income, um, aside from the weirdness of 2018, uh, I, I feel like you also had or, you know, a, a, you kind of sensed a red flag that this study and this New York Times article claimed that child poverty had fallen like 60 percent since the 90s, which basically, according to them, would, you know, make the U.S. no longer a statistical outlier uh, among, you know, uh, first world or like OECD countries in terms of child poverty. Uh, and, and, and something that you mention in your pieces is, you know, there's there's uh there's there's something interesting going on with the way that these researchers happen to be measuring poverty and you know as you alluded to how they're also measuring the effects of the social safety net specifically uh the earned income tax credit and the CTC as you mentioned. Um now you also say in your piece that you don't really like debating poverty measures and I do want to get to that in a second uh but but just in terms of you know this long-term decline in child poverty why why didn't that seem right to you and what what like what measures were the researchers using that kind of produced this effect, I guess? Yeah, you know, I know the data set that they've used. That data set has been out for seven years. Of course, the last couple of years gets kind of added as things go along. So I'm full, you know, like that was one of the things that irritated me about the New York Times piece, frankly, is it's like brand new data set. This is right. like, literally seven years old. I've been playing with this for seven years. Um, and so immediately, you know, I know what they're doing, right? They, they take the poverty line in 2012 and it's called an anchored poverty line. And then they just adjust that for inflation up and down the years. And this is an old trick. I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to say trick that maybe is put too much malice, but if you've seen some of the conservative poverty papers, they like to do the same thing, but they like to anchor it to like 1960, you know, <laughs> and say, well, if you look at the 1960 poverty line, man, we're really, we're killing it. Um, <laughs> And, you know, this is not as pronounced as that, but it has a similar effect, especially as you go further back in time, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're looking at poverty in 1960 using the 2012 poverty measure, I think the series goes back to 1967. Mm -hmm. What's well, going to be, you know, high, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, because it's a different era, you know? Um, and so that's the approach they use is they use this anchored measure. And the more typical approach you see in international comparisons is what's called a relative poverty measure. And the way that works is you just take the median income, you cut it in half and you mm -hmm. say anyone who has less than half the median, we're going to call that poor. Um, and that makes it for nice, clean comparisons across countries. You don't have to have all these dis debates about purchase purchasing power parity and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that and you point this out, the, the very first paragraph of the New York Times pieces, they, they frame the whole thing as like, oh, at least, you know, <laughs> Where Europe used to be so much more better than us, and, and now actually we're down to, you know, we're, we're kind of where they are. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, the measures on which Europe beats us, which are these relative poverty measures, they still are beating us by the same exact amounts mm -hmm. as they were before. So you use this measure that they don't even use. Mm -hmm. You know, who knows? I mean, if we were to anchor, uh, you know, Swedish poverty to the 19, you know, 85 or pick some number like that, who knows mm -hmm. where that would be, you know? So there's a kind of abuse of statistics here and also just a lack of recognition that there are a lot of poverty measures. This is kind of the only unique one that's really looks like this yeah. and maybe incorporate other measures, you know, <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of just hinging it on this outlier, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I want to wrap up uh, by by just staying on this question of poverty measures, uh, because, you know, I think for people who aren't social scientists, uh, you, you've already sort of um, outlined some of the ways that researchers look at poverty. I think the one that people might be familiar with is the supplemental poverty measure, which is interesting because that's the one that sort of takes into account social safety net programs. Right. And um, I think on a kind of political level, uh, this poverty measure is sort of supposed to show that social safety net programs and welfare programs do help people and, and sort of help bounce people out of poverty. Um, I don't think you would disagree with that. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I guess I want to ask you as somebody who, you know, has a political and kind of personal interest in welfare state programs and specifically programs that are meant to kind of boost families and kids out of poverty, um, someone who's also a quantitative researcher, like what's a better way of looking at the problem of child poverty? Uh, because, you know, my sense is that the 
the New York Times author and, you know, the authors of the original study, uh, what, what they're trying to show is that welfare state programs help, right? But, uh, you know, I... They, yeah, I mean, they do help, and, and no doubt. But the, I guess the main thing that initially had irritated me about it, when you're talking about child poverty in particular, right, what happened in the 90s is we got rid of the means-tested benefit for the poorest kids. That was not a great benefit. I'm not here to defend that benefit. You know, that's not how I would design anything. We got rid of that, and we used these tax credits, mm -hmm. which basically targeted the upper half of poor kids. Right away, you're already playing games when you start targeting the upper half of poor kids because we count poverty as being reduced if you bring someone over the line. So you mm -hmm. target right below the line, you can get people over the line, right? You target the very poor, you don't get them all the way over the line, and it doesn't count. And that's mm -hmm. a ridiculous way of measuring anything. Um, but the other thing is the tax credits that we switch to, they don't measure them really. Yeah. What they do is they call up, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and they take this income survey and they say, how much money did you earn last year? They call them in March and they ask them, how much did you earn last year? Already, that's a, a questionable approach. Right. <laughs> um, if you, I don't know that I could tell you how much I earned last year, you know, three right. months later. Um, then they take that amount that they say and they run it through a tax simulator, right? Um, you know, and, and then that'll tell you how much tax credit you're owed. And that's mm -hmm. what they give you. That's what yeah. they say you got. But we know through other research that just says, instead of doing that, why don't we look at what the IRS actually has on record as mm -hmm. sending out to these people? And let's put that value in there. When you right. put that value in there, the what you find is that the tax simulators are overstating the poverty reduction by like 67%. Yeah. And then I've gone further than that and said, you need to do more than that. It's not just we need to look at the IRS paid. We also need to realize that people are not getting this money in the year that they need it. They mm -hmm. get it the year later and mm -hmm. we're, we're counting it as if they're getting it in the prior year. And we're also not counting tax prep fees, which take like 13 to 22% of, mm -hmm. of these benefits. So mm -hmm. when you do all that, I've, I've found that it's overstated by 100%. So <laughs> that's what really irritated me more than anything is it's like this child, the, th the approach we've taken to child poverty with these tax credits is so bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bad. And yet here we are just like, you know, mission accomplished kind of stuff. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Um, well, I guess then to wrap up, uh, obviously people can go to the People's Policy Project website and find very detailed sort of outlines and policy recommendations. Uh, but since you have been kind of on the child tax credit and just child poverty beat, uh, you know, for a while, but specifically in this last, you know, last year, last two years, what are sort of the top three uh, child poverty reduction programs that People's Policy Project would recommend right now? Yeah, I mean, number one is a universal child benefit paid every yeah. month. We sort of had something like that last year, um, but you know, you could make it a lot better than that. Number two, free child care. Of course, it's uh, we give free education from age five to eighteen, and then we don't give it for kids, even though they're more expensive. A one-year-old, right. a two-year-old, way more expensive than an eight-year-old. Um, that I would say that's one and two. After that. I mean, that's really the big two. You can throw in paid leave and stuff yeah. like that. That matters a little bit. But you're talking about six months of you know, a kid's <laughs> life. Uh, but like, those are the big ones. So Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we will go ahead and link Matt's articles on the New York Times article and the, uh, the study it covered below. Matt, great to see you as always. And thanks for your time. Thank you. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.